curiosity, compassion, courage, community. These are the building blocks of creating social impact. From soup kitchens to lifting people out of poverty, social impact is really just a series of people working together to create change. It can happen in living rooms, in classrooms, in community halls, at city hall. Social impact is a force for good everywhere. And it's not just the activists, the do-gooders, the tree huggers, the raging grannies. Everyone can be a change maker. Now, change starts with curiosity. And you have to be curious about who you are, where you come from, and how the experiences in your life shape the way you see the world. Now, I was born in Hong Kong, and we moved to Canada when I was two years old. My parents instilled in me values such as hard work, responsibility, and accountability. As uh, traditional Asian parents, uh, high marks in school was a top priority. And also, like many Asian parents, uh, feeding your child food was a symbol of giving them good health and nourishment. And they fed me quite well. <laughs> I don't need to tell you who I was in that picture. This is a picture of me and three of my cousins. We were all the same age, different sizes. Now, my curiosity about myself was also influenced by the experiences I had as a child. And teachers played a large part in that. In grade two, I decided, for whatever reason, to audition for the school choir. I could not sing, but I auditioned anyways. And uh, this is like American Idol for seven-year-olds. I got there, and I sang Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. The next day, the music teacher posted a piece of paper on the music room door with all the names of the kids that made the choir. And all of us ran excitedly, and I was right in the middle of it, and I scanned that list of names. And I scanned it again, and a third time, and my name was not on that list. Virtually every other kid's name was on that list, and I remember thinking to myself, I'm never ever going to take a risk ever again. Fortunately, I had teachers that encouraged other things in me. They encouraged me to be a leader, to organize events, to help other students that needed support. And it was those teachers that gave me the confidence to focus on my strengths and not my weaknesses. They were the ones that helped me shape this identity where it really became about what I was able to do and not what I was unable to do. And I think it really takes uh, your identity to form to a point where you know yourself and then you can focus on helping other people. So it was into high school and university where I really started to explore and understand compassion. Through volunteering, I was interested and curious about other people and how I could help. Now, caring and compassion are part of human nature, but I think it also needs some nurturing. Uh, recently, uh, I have a three-year-old son, Gavin, and he was goofing around at the top of the staircase that led to our basement, and there are about 20 stairs. You can anticipate what's going to happen in this story. He fell down the stairs, and my six-year-old daughter, Maddie, was eating dinner at the dinner table, completely apathetic to her brother's pain. Uh, my wife and I ran down and tended to him, and thankfully he was okay. So then we turned our attention to our daughter. And my wife took this as an opportunity to have a, a, a teaching moment. And after the lesson on empathy, Maddie uh, wrote a letter to Gavin. It's one of those times as a parent that you're quite proud <laughs> of what transpires. Now, but there's bad news. Compassion and empathy have taken a back seat to the pursuit of wealth. In the marketplace, compassion is often seen as an exercise in charity. And there's nothing wrong with that per se. 
But when you equate giving back, often, more often than not, that becomes an afterthought. So we live in this world where we have certain false assumptions that we believe that there's this invisible hand coordinating all of us selfish beings. And the philosopher Adam Smith, who wrote Wealth of Nations, well, he also wrote another book called Theory of Moral Sentiments. And in that book, he describes human behavior quite differently than this invisible hand concept. He describes us deriving our happiness when we see others being happy. Yet we still live in this economic model that casts humanity as primarily selfish, where compassion and empathy are relegated as an afterthought. This needs to change. There are studies that show that empathy does exist, that you can generate empathy between two people, and you can generate empathy between perfect strangers as well. Studies have shown that women are more empathic than men, that testosterone is correlated to higher levels of competitive behavior and lower levels of collaboration. So it's not surprising that we have walked down this path where we see environmental destruction and increasing inequalities in society. Now the solution, in my view, is actually quite simple. It's not about let's go colonize Mars or wait for a major technical or technological breakthrough. We just have to look within and look deep into our history. For example, indigenous culture believes that all humans are connected to a common system, are connected to Mother Earth. Compassion is a core value of humanity, but we just need to express it. And when it gets challenged, when opposing or misaligned forces challenge us, well, that's when we need courage. I went to the University of Alberta, and uh, I had some amazing professors when, when I was there. But I also had some professors that didn't believe that social impact and business necessarily related to each other. And this became increasingly uncomfortable for me because that conflicted with my personal values. And so this doesn't really make sense in retrospect, but I decided to take more school, to stay in school, and I uh, committed to doing a PhD. My intention was to uh, explore that space of integrating sustainability concepts in our business teaching. Uh, so I did this PhD, and partway through, I was trying to balance this life of staying involved in the community, but also focusing on academics. So I wasn't the most productive PhD student. So one day, our PhD coordinator calls me into his office. And I remember it so viscerally. It was cold, it was in the winter, it was a blistering wind, snow was flying, it was dark, and it was just me and him, Friday, like 4 o'clock. He sits me down and says, Leo, I think you should quit the program. And it's one of those moments where you feel like every fiber of your body is being tested. How do you respond to this challenge? So I took some time. It was probably just a few seconds, but it felt like minutes. And I responded. I said, uh, no thanks. Very Canadian way of responding. <laughs> no thanks. Um, you know, I, I am committed to the things that I believe in, and I truly believe that I want to make a difference in this world. I'm going to stay involved in the things that I believe in, in the community, but I also want to be able to accomplish some of this through my work in, as an academic, through my teaching and my research. So we kind of agreed to disagree, but he didn't force me out. I luckily survived, and I finished my PhD. I mean, the story would be very different if I didn't finish, and it, it would be a really flat story. So <laughs> thankfully, I finished. And uh, you know, I look back at that time with a lot of uh, pride that I was able to stand up for some of the beliefs that I had. That if I didn't know myself well enough, I don't think I would have had the courage to stand up at that challenge point. Now, he asked me, he told me this during our meeting. He said, serving the community while serving or studying business will not make you successful. 
And that has stuck with me so much. It's not because my career now is all in spite of the thing that he said. <laughs> but when certain people say things to you, it drives a certain type of behavior and a certain type of response. And I share this with my students all the time, to really be the determiner of your own success and not let other people determine how you see success. So when you bring people together into a community and you're all working for this common goal to better the lives of people in this world, it is probably the most powerful experience you're going to have. You can't do it alone. You have to work with others. And so let me just demonstrate quickly a simple test to show the value of collaboration, or I guess the opposite of that. In this test, all you need to do is look at the first three lines of this passage and count the number of times you see the letter F. For most people, you'll see more than at least one. How many people here see two Fs? How many people see three Fs? How many people see four Fs? So the majority of people saw three Fs. Let me show you where those Fs are. Most of you saw this one. Most of you saw this one. And then here are <laughs> the third and the fourth together. Now doing it by yourself, the majority were unsuccessful. But if you were able to collaborate, if you could just help each other, you would have avoided this the syndrome where you repeat the same strategies. So in a community, we need to come together. And I'm going to leave with this thought, that we want you to promise yourself to be a change maker. Express that to the public. Nikosi Johnson, a 12-year-old, uh, he, he passed away when he was 12 year old. He was a South African child activist born with HIV AIDS. And he said, do all you can with what you have in the time you have in the place you are. Because change starts from within. Thank you. <laughs>